Okay. I guess audio-wise we are fine, right? So I guess we should get started. Welcome uh, to this talk about Go Big or Go Home, SAP's journey to offering a public platform as a service built with Cloud Foundry. Who am I to actually talk about that topic? So that's me. Uh, my name is Bernd Kranich. I'm the technical lead for taking Cloud Foundry from the open source and making that part of SAP Cloud Platform, so SAP's platform as a service offering. So we're really indeed building an own SAP-based Cloud Foundry um, delivery and putting that out to the market. So we recently GA'd with that technology. Um, about my history with SAP, I guess some would call me an SAP veteran. Uh, 19 years with the company, meanwhile. Um, I actually started in more the kind of mode one uh, world, if, if you will, um, basically with the stuff that made SAP big. Um, so classical on-premise businesses, stuff that is actually running uh, the core of, of many enterprises um, today. So I started in the business information warehouse, so SAP's data warehouse solution there in the front end piece. Um, as I said, classical on-premise basically, then moved over to um, the business objects division of SAP when SAP acquired business objects. So uh, I was with, with that team for, for quite some time. Then I guess moved one layer down the stack actually to be with the ABAP application server teams. So basically ABAP is SAP's own programming language and development environment, and this is what is really powering um, many of SAP's core business systems. So I guess from that perspective, I kind of know the mode one world quite a bit. And then um, some, some years ago, I actually moved over to more the mode two world um, with moving over to what was called SAP HANA cloud platform back then and is now called uh, SAP cloud platform. Okay, so what do I wanna talk about? Um, I wanna talk about SAP and SAP cloud platform. How does SAP actually come from being that mode one um, company powering many enterprises and businesses across the world to being a cloud company? How does that work? I also want to talk about specifically Cloud Foundry and what it actually took for us to take Cloud Foundry and made, make that part of SAP Cloud Platform and what we learned uh, along that way. And, and that is, I, I guess, both interesting for people who are thinking about taking Cloud Foundry, running that themselves, or our um, fellow competition to basically see and find, like, did SAP face similar challenges or different challenges, or even people that are trying to um, use Cloud Foundry and then see what does it actually take to run the system underneath and really run that at production scale. And then last but not least, I want to close off with saying what is actually next for SAP Cloud Platform uh, with a focus on Cloud Foundry. So that is kind of the standard starting slide. I try to make it not that boring. Uh, I guess it's sufficient to say that we are um, driving many of uh, the big enterprises of the world. So 76% of SAP, uh, of, of the world's transactional revenue touches an SAP system. There's millions of people that are actually um, using our cloud solution. Um, many of the Forbes 2000 companies uh, are SAP customers, and, and this is, I guess, one of the fun facts. 79% um, of the world's chocolate production uh, is produced by SAP customers using one of the SAP systems. And you can run similar analogies with beer and cars and like many traditional goods that uh, everybody is familiar with. So that's like on, on, on that part of, of, of the figure side, let's look a little bit into the company um, and also into our customer base. So 350,000 plus customers in 180 plus countries. I guess that's quite, quite a number. Uh, more than 80,000 employees across 130 countries. So I guess we are following um, our customers in, in many of, of the countries that, that they are actually in. Um, about a third, uh, fourth of, of the employee base being in research and development, 23,000 plus. Then also quite a big partner ecosystem. So there is 
like many SAP partners, more than 15,000 um, across the world that are helping our customers to put SAP solution into production, um, doing consulting, et cetera, et cetera. And also quite an impressive figure, 125 million subscribers for our cloud-based solutions, which is like um, a kind of development that was actually fostered by another thing, which is showing you a little bit of, of history of, of how we actually came to SAP Cloud Platform and how SAP evolved from this traditional R3 type of company to being a cloud company as well. So uh, you can see on that chart that things actually started with a mix of technology and solution innovations as well as acquisitions. So the first one was around acquiring Sybase, so database and mobile uh, company basically back in, in 2010. And then there was a, I would say, quick succession of, on the one hand side, technology and solution launches, as well as additional acquisitions. So I, I guess many people in, in this room are familiar with um, solutions like SAP Success Factors or even Conquer to, to book your travel to here and do the, the uh, expenses uh, via that, um, as well as SAP own built products like SAP HANA, uh, SAP's in-memory database solution, as well as the SAP HANA Enterprise Cloud, as I said, as it was called previously. So SAP's platform as a service offering, um, as well as then building on top of SAP, in brackets, HANA Enterprise Cloud additional solutions um, that have been launched, for example, in 2015, uh, 2016, and then also 2017. So what does that all have to do actually with, with Cloud Foundry? Um, so basically, um, what, what we can say about SAP Cloud Platform today, and, and the chart that I just showed was, was basically um, kind of built on an own platform as a service offering, um, coming to more than 7,000 uh, SAP Cloud Platform customers, building quite a few applications on top of that platform. So as I said, um, partners are important for SAP and the SAP ecosystem. So it's important to have partners that are actually using the platform. So we have um, partners that are building quite a few applications. Then also enterprise applications that are delivered running on SAP Cloud Platform, um, as well as an app center that is a marketplace, kind of an app store type of thing, um, where customers can buy additional solutions. As I said, what does that all have to do with, with Cloud Foundry, actually? Um, so Cloud Foundry, and you might have seen uh, the keynote of, of our CTO, Bjorn Gerke, on, on day one. We have a bit on an on and off relationship with, with Cloud Foundry at, at SAP. So we started looking into Cloud Foundry pretty early on when it was announced by VMware back then in, in 2011. Um, people on the engineering side looked into the Cloud Foundry offering, found it pretty interesting from a technical perspective, but then uh, we actually figured out that like the licensing scheme and the way it was handling open source and uh, IP w was actually not fitting to, to our business needs and, and business model. So back in 2011, we basically had a no-go decision to not go with Cloud Foundry, uh, but instead, build an own platform as, as a service technology. Things started to change then in 2013, um, when actually IBM um, teamed up with Cloud Foundry overall, and even SAP did first open source contributions to Cloud Foundry with a service broker uh, that was built to actually provision instances for our SAP HANA and memory database. Shortly after, beginning of, of 2014, SAP was actually joining the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, and then having a keynote at the Cloud Foundry Summit at, at this year. So this is kind of, I would say, more, more of the formal stuff. But then also, back then, um, the actual work wa was beginning to look into Cloud Foundry from, from a technical perspective. I guess it was pretty much three years ago, May 2014, when we first started to take the version of Cloud Foundry back then and try to bring it up on, on Amazon Web Services. Uh, and then shortly after, we also figured out that it's not sufficient to just like use whatever is in the open source, but we also need to 
um, contribute to the open source and know more about the open source in detail. So we sent first SAP employees to a Cloud Foundry dojo here in San Francisco. 2015 then marked the start of our collaboration with a big customer, Siemens. Um, Siemens is running their MindSphere platform, so their IoT platform um, with the help of SAP's Cloud Foundry offering. So the basis for Siemens MindSphere is actually SAP Cloud Platform. And then shortly after, end of 2015, we were also uh, achieving the certification to be a Cloud Foundry certified platform, which was also a, a major step. And we indeed renewed that certification in, in 2017. So then uh, 2016, Siemens went live with their MindSphere platform. Um, but not only that, but also we as SAP Cloud Platform had a first beta version of a Cloud Foundry powered system that people could actually have a look at. We launched it at our big SAP fair called Sapphire in May 2016, and we've seen quite some, some ad adoption ever since, and also used that to gain further experience scaling up Cloud Foundry, obviously. So then later on, I said we were already sending people to the Cloud Foundry Dojo in 2015, or even 2014. Uh, 2016, we actually opened our own dojo. So we said we also need to actively influence certain parts of Cloud Foundry. And one of the early areas was to say, uh, we want to contribute to making sure that Cloud Foundry runs very nicely on top of OpenStack as an infrastructure as a service. So we took over the project leadership of uh, that part, the Bosch OpenStack CPI, and also opened a dojo uh, that was then also joined by colleagues from SUSE. So SAP and SUSE are currently driving uh, the OpenStack CPI efforts, and there's plans to even um, extend the, the ownership in, in the Bosch space uh, even further. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Uh, then last but not least, end of uh, 2016, um, on top of Looking into OpenStack and Amazon Web Services, we started a collaboration with Microsoft Azure and also Google Cloud. Um, and that then in 2017 also brought some um, fruitful results in the end. So 2017, as I said, we renewed our certification. We had first SAP solutions that are actually built on SAP Cloud Platform Cloud Foundry um, that are, were being announced and are now going out to the market. And then finally, in May this year, so around about a month ago, we announced a general available SAP Cloud Platform Cloud Foundry offering um, to people. So that is, by and large, a little bit more detailed look at the adoption timeline. So let's look at what it means to actually deploy uh, SAP Cloud Platform. So this is kind of the tentative data center build out plan. So you basically see that um, SAP Cloud Platform is either today or in the very near future um, running on all the major infrastructure as a service providers. That means Amazon Web Services. We have a beta on Microsoft Azure and we plan to um, release on Google Cloud Platform soon, I would say. On top of that, uh, we are also running SAP Cloud Platform in SAP's data centers. Um, and that is a mix of the existing SAP Cloud Platform technology as well as Cloud Foundry based on OpenStack. And there is quite an ambitious plan to extend that coverage of, of data centers even further. Um, and you can see that here. So, so why are we actually doing that? Like, why are we not focusing on, on one of those deployment methods but are running a true multi-cloud strategy and are with that multi-cloud strategy, at least to my knowledge, one of the very few vendors that are actually offering a public platform as a service offering on Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and soon Google Cloud Platform. So essentially one reason is to say that specific customers have specific needs. Some customers say, I'm in competition with Amazon as a retailer, so you won't see my data going to AWS. Or other customers are saying, I already have a large enterprise contract with Microsoft Azure, so I want to see SAP Cloud Platform running on that infrastructure as well. So, and, and then also there is obviously data protection and um, certain legal requirements to basically be in certain geographies when it comes to um, deploying enterprise critical data. So that is one of the reasons why we are running that true multi-cloud strategy. 
Okay, so only some, some very few impressions on, on how that actually looks like from, from a customer perspective. Um, this is our cockpit entry page where you see the various data centers that people can, can select from. Just a brief browse through then parts of the service catalog where you can see um, the services that we are actually offering from big data services to like traditional open source databases like MongoDB or Postgres, things like Redis and RabbitMQ, but then also SAP services like the SAP HANA in memory database or SAP ASE as an additional database offering. And then last but not least, uh, integrating that into basically the way how Cloud Foundry is displaying things, an ability to start stop applications, scale them up even via the UI, not only the command line, etc. Okay, so that's the high level overview with kind of quote unquote architectural boxes on uh, SAP Cloud Platform, Cloud Foundry. So you can see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the support for various infrastructure providers. Uh, you can see a layering of services for data and storage, certain platform services, uh, and then programming models and, and DevOps tools. So usually at that point in time, I get the question of like, how do you guys differentiate from other Cloud Foundry based offerings? And my kind of standard answer is up until that point, we don't even want to differentiate. And I'm going to spend a couple of words on, on why that is uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Where we see ourselves actually differentiating is what made SAP strong. So SAP being a 45 year old company, kind of for the entire lifetime focusing on um, providing business driven services and applications. And this is where we think as SAP, we can actually differentiate by enabling um, both SAP internal groups to build business services and business applications on top of our platform, as well as enabling our partner and, and customer ecosystem to do the same. And then by that, enriching the platform by more and more business services and APIs. So that's one important differentiator. The other important differentiator is shown here on the left and on the right, which is our existing on-premise and software as a service offerings. So obviously we as SAP have an interest to make sure that you can nicely integrate with other SAP offerings. And um, as, as many SAP customers are looking for a way to enhance their mode one business, so for example, an SAP S4 HANA or an SAP Business Suite with more agile ways in a kind of mode two fashion, SAP Cloud Platform is the ideal way to actually build those types of application and service, iterate rapidly on, on those and basically make them available to a broad range of customers, be it via mobile devices, be it by hooking in uh, IoT devices, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the high level overview. And, but then I also wanted to get back to the slide that Björn Gorke showed on day one around the detailed uh, components. I also don't want to bore you with, let's say, explaining all the boxes. But what I can say is actually people that want to go with running Cloud Foundry itself, it's not only running Cloud Foundry itself. There's a whole lot of other things that you actually need to consider. So if you look at that slide a bit more closely, you will actually find that the Cloud Foundry box is maybe one third of the overall architecture only. And this is because Cloud Foundry is, is a great environment for 12 factor applications and has great abstractions, but then Cloud Foundry itself doesn't solve problems around how do you actually monitor that whole thing? How do you actually receive the logs and collect the logs and analyze the logs of the applications that are running on top of it? How do you monitor those applications? What do you do about continuous integration? And most importantly, what do you do with backing services? Like taking Cloud Foundry from the open source is nice and fine, but writing a 12-factor application without any backing service will probably not provide any, any good value. So you need to have a good set of backing services available and Cloud Foundry itself does not provide an answer to how do you actually manage, operate, back up, et cetera, et cetera, all those backing services. So if you're looking into spinning up your own Cloud Foundry environment, the stuff that I just mentioned is important, additional considerations uh, along that journey. Plus then obviously the fact that like you have different IAS layers underneath, so that opens a whole lot of uh, additional questions, at least if you are not um, able or willing to focus on, on just one infrastructure as a service. So what did we learn along the way? Uh, we learned quite a lot, I have to say, in, in the last three years. 
And uh, I have categorized that in, in five categories, knowledge, open source, operations, security, and certifications. And I want to spend a bit of time on, on each of those. So what did we learn in the area of knowledge? So first of all, it's important to train the people that are building and operating Cloud Foundry. And for us, actually, it, it started with like even the hiring process when by chance, many people came across our job postings and then had suddenly the feedback of, we didn't even know that SAP is doing that cool stuff, right? So we, SAP traditionally known as kind of the very boring mode one kind of thing, and then usually also our job postings, starting with explaining what SAP does, but that does not necessarily reach the people that you need to reach um, to actually run something like Cloud Foundry. So you want to have the people that are kind of either fresh from university, are keen to learn, or have a background in things like networking and operations, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to look into uh, changing our hiring process there. Then once you've hired people, the next question is how you, do you train them? Because usually you do not get the people that already know it all, which is fine, because like, that stuff can be learned, but how do you learn that? Um, and there we figured out that actually Dojo is a nice way to, to train people and get people up to speed, but then also taking um, the methodologies inside the Dojo and applying that to our own development is, is another key factor. So things like pair programming, if you have the right people that are open to that, is an excellent way to actually share the knowledge inside the organization. Also, many people inside SAP are more coming from a traditional uh, environment with a single language, maybe ABAP, maybe Java. We've moved that completely by kind of having all of our people actually being now polyglot. Things like Ruby, Go, Bash scripts don't scare them anymore. So uh, expect a steep learning curve for, for those people. So multi-cloud, as I said, another challenge. Infrastructures are similar, but then have subtle differences. Um, people need to dig through that themselves. There's no, like, this is the difference between AWS and Azure course. Um, people need to learn that uh, in, in more detail. And in order to be able to learn that, they need to know the good old basics. So stuff like, what is a distributed systems? What is actually networking? What does that Linux thing do? Um, why do I need to actually work on the shell and not have a GUI or an IDE uh, to, to work with that stuff? And then last but not least, also a topic for SAP, the environment that you're doing or that you're running Cloud Foundry in needs to support it. And if it doesn't support it out of the box, it actually needs to be changed to support it. So, so things like corporate proxies that like enterprise IT applications or uh, departments usually put in place are definitely preventing um, adoption of, of cloud-based software. Things like everybody gets a Windows laptop when they're on board is preventing development in, in a cloud-based environment. So it's those seemingly relatively simple things, but then it takes quite a bit to, to actually change that. Training people using Cloud Foundry is also important. So um, I've talked about what does it take to run Cloud Foundry, now what does it take to actually um, write an application on top of Cloud Foundry. So we traditionally, again, have many people coming more from the on-premise world and taking or doing that mindset change takes quite some time, uh, but then also some effort. So here's a couple of, of figures of um, our people from what is called the cloud curriculum, so a specific department inside SAP that are running training courses in order to make sure that the people that are onboarding towards a cloud journey have the right mindset. That starts from like very basic trainings, like what is the difference between on-prem and, and cloud, just from, from a principal's perspective, over to training them on, on microservices, continuous delivery, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are onboarding on, on a Cloud Foundry journey, make sure that um, you have appropriate training for the people in place. And then also those trainings provide a nice stress test for the Cloud Foundry instance that you're actually spinning up because like mostly those trainings are around you deploy an application, you create a backing service, you bind that backing service, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not single users that are doing that, but it's maybe 50 or 100 that are doing that in parallel. So we actually learned quite a bit from, from that, um, and especially on what is called our Canary system. So that is our internal development system that most people uh, inside SAP are actually using. And that has seen in peak times as many as 4,000 active developers, meaning developers that have logged in in a time span of two weeks and that are working with that system. So 
like judging from the number of people in R&D at SAP, 23,000 roughly, 4,000 of them using that Cloud Foundry instance, you can see kind of the order of magnitude uh, inside SAP that Cloud Foundry has, has meanwhile reached. So what did we learn on, on the open source side of the house? Open source has definitely won the enterprise, period. Uh, there's no other way of like any single company doing all the stuff themselves and then like still being successful. Um, openness, meanwhile, is also an important selling aspect towards uh, our customers, and then it's also an important discussion with, with our partners. So if you're not open, you're oftentimes out of, of any um, business discussion. But then open source consumption itself is not enough. So open source consumption is like the first step. If you are serious about open source, you need to go into contribution, which then leads you into actually actively influencing the community which is what SAP is, is doing for, for Cloud Foundry. Um, open source initially saves some time because you don't have to write all that code yourself, that is clear, uh, but don't be mistaken, you still need to know that code. So even if you haven't written it yourself, um, you need to be able to read it, to understand it, to debug it, to operate it. So that is important uh, skill set to, to actually build up. Also, another advice from, from our experience, use the open source as it was actually intended to be used. Don't try to invent like interesting ways of saying, hey, this open source has this great feature and I can, can combine it nicely and kind of turn it into something that was maybe not originally intended to be that way, uh, but I use it that way uh, simply because the open source underneath you could just change and then like your nice ideas might just turn into something that was a temporary thing. Forking means death. Don't fork open source and then like be uh, brave and say I can continue to maintain that stuff, um, which is also critical when, when it comes to, to the security aspect. Um, processes, make sure that your internal processes are set up. I've talked about that already. And um, What I can also say as a result of open source usage in Cloud Foundry at SAP is that um, SAP Cloud Platform Cloud Foundry meanwhile represents the biggest usage of open source uh, inside SAP by far, I would say. So what is our credo uh, for open source? Um, SAP's goal is to actually commoditize the platform as a service layer. So with the lowest possible effort, we want to take whatever comes from Cloud Foundry in the open source and bring that into production. We want to use as much open source as possible where we find that there's areas inside the open source that are not sufficient for our needs. We, instead of keeping things proprietary, want to contribute to the open source. Because again, uh, we have realized and, and come to know that doing things alone is, is actually much slower and much harder than doing it in the community. In that sense, we are more kind of a distributor of, of um, platform as a service with Cloud Foundry. And then last but not least, on, on the influencing part, it's definitely an important aspect for SAP to make sure that Cloud Foundry stays the ecosystem of choice for the industry in, in the years to come. So we feel topics like, for example, containerization, especially Kubernetes and its relation to Cloud Foundry is an important topic. Topics around security and compliance uh, is another important topic. So we want to make sure that uh, Cloud Foundry stays on top of, of those developments. Our commitment to Cloud Foundry, um, Björn Gerke in his keynote has, has shown that quite a bit. So we have instantiated and are actively managing quite a few open source projects be it on the OpenStack side, be it on the side of managing services. Service Fabric is, is one of uh, the open sourcings that we did there to manage enterprise-ready services. Topics around security, like for example IPsec, uh, in order to securely communicate um, between VMs inside a Bosch deployment. Abacus as a way to meter your Cloud Foundry environment. A Kubernetes CPI as one initial experiment to actually look into, into the direction of what does it, the intersection between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes actually do? Java memory assistant, et cetera, et cetera. We have major contributions in many of, of the core areas of Cloud Foundry, but also in many of the extension areas of, of Cloud Foundry. And obviously more committers in, in much more areas. Just a quick peek on, on that one. This is actually showing in orange the number of pull requests with SAP involvement. That means either pull requests that have been created by SAP starting from 2014 until May 2017 over time, um, or the pull requests that were actually pulled in by SAP um, 
full-time committers to certain projects, and that is indeed growing nicely. Similar things can be said about the total contributors per month that are actually contributing, as well as distinct contributors per month. So what did we learn on, on the operations front? Bosch is definitely a great tool, uh, which is powering um, our Cloud Foundry landscapes. It's a standard. Um, we like it. We have survived many critical situations by, by the help of, of Bosch. And it also en enables our multi-cloud strategy. So we wouldn't be able to ship on four infrastructure layer as a service um, if we wouldn't have Bosch underneath that is actually driving all of that. Um, observing stuff in production is always the better case instead of sitting back and thinking about theoretical problems that you want to solve. Learn from what you have put in production, adapt your strategy based on that, and then iterate quickly on, on that. And deployments can grow really huge, which is why um, we are glad that we have Bosch to, to manage all of those deployments. And surprisingly enough, even if you think there's many big Cloud Foundry deployments out there, we're still hitting certain limits that other people didn't hit. And we are every now and then asking ourselves, why did other people not hit those limits? Like initially when GoRouter came out, we hit performance limits where we thought, okay, like GoRouter uh, is kind of completely rewritten in Go and should actually scale uh, very nicely. Initial performance measurements showed that this was not the case. Um, fortunately, we were able to provide that feedback to Shannon Cohn and the Go Router team. They adapted based on that feedback, and now I think the Go Router scaling is actually where we needed to have. Similar things can be said about memory calculation in the Java build pack and also metrics. Um, real quick, a sneak peek, and you don't need new glasses. I've blurred that image a little bit on uh, Conquerors. So everybody is using Conquerors, I guess. We use it for both deployment as well as monitoring of our systems, but why I actually brought in that picture is to show you um, what we do with Conquerors. So we have development systems, not only one, but many of them, where the actual functionality of SAP Cloud Platform is developed. We need to have it on the four infrastructure layers. That development is then consolidated into staging systems, again, on all the four infrastructures. That is brought into our internal canary landscape, so the testing landscape that I talked about earlier. From there, it goes into what is called a hotfix system, because in order to do a fix in the live system, you need to have a system that actually reflects the live status and where you can test your, your patch, basically. That, again, has to be on all four infrastructure layers to cater for uh, the differences between them. And then last but not least, that floats into our live systems. So by just counting the number of boxes and concourse pipelines, you can maybe get a glimpse of the order of magnitude that we are running Cloud Foundry on. Um, so then, uh, second to last, security, open source security. I guess the basic statement is that we can say, if you want to sleep well at night, don't use open source, because if you use open source, your vulnerabilities will be pretty visible to you, and they will be published out to um, the world, basically, and everybody seeing those vulnerabilities has a chance to attack your system. So you better know what you're actually shipping with your deployment, and it's not only Cloud Foundry, but also all the other stuff and the stuff that you package into applications. You need to have an agile security response process because um, once those vulnerabilities are published, you basically need to be able to react quickly, to patch quickly, to bring in changes, and to make your systems, again, secure. And oftentimes, fall forward is the best strategy to do that. So be able to adopt the latest releases of Cloud Foundry in essentially no time, roll that out to production. This is a safe way to, to keep your system secure. Cloud security also has changed. Um, it's different from on-premise security. This, like you build a big castle wall and then like everybody uh, basically runs through that or against that wall and, and can't, can't get in. This is dead. This is on-premise worlds. You need to have um, security in depth where you have various barriers of, of security in place. Um, you need to take care about authentication, authorization, and encryption of everything that goes in and out the system, but also inside the system. And usually penetration testing, so external people trying to hack you, um, but are then also paid by you, is a good way to actually learn the things that you did not figure out yourself. And last but not least, multi-cloud forces you to generalize certain concepts, like if you want to run on multiple infrastructure layers, um, then you need to generalize certain concepts in security as well. 
So last thing, uh, certifications. Uh, we have an ISO 27001 certification for some of our environments. We are Cloud Foundry certified. Um, topics that are still remaining, and that um, is related to Cloud Foundry itself, is topics around separation of duties. So if you are a Cloud Foundry administrator, you are essentially ruling the entire system. You can see all the things that your users can see. This is a concern for us, and this is some area that actually we see some demand to, to change things. Uh, and credentials rotation is another one that actually comes from certification, so be able to change your credentials rapidly, where we think CredHub uh, is a great project that will push Cloud Foundry in the exactly right direction. Um, there's a lot of work hidden in certifications, and you can solve many topics with either technology or process. If you solve them with process-only solutions, meaning you have responsibilities and like this person needs to do that, that might bite you later on. Okay, with that, last but not least, what's next? For SAP Cloud Platform, expanding our multi-cloud strategy, more data centers, infrastructures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, more SAP applications and services, also partners and customers, obviously, and contributing more to Cloud Foundry. And then last but not least, Cloud Foundry itself stays dynamic, so we want to make sure that the Cloud Foundry ecosystem um, keeps up with the changes in the container world, especially on, on Kubernetes, uh, and us answering the question of, like, does it, is it really required to co-innovate um, or to not co-innovate in a world between Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry is one of our major questions, as well as is API management, because in a microservices world, um, APIs are, are paramount, and Cloud Foundry could need a little bit more support for, for those types of, of scenarios. With that, one last thing. Uh, there's a trial out that everybody can subscribe to and, and try out uh, what we have built up. That is one uh, URL and QR code to, to actually look at. And then last but not least, we are hiring. Um, so if you want to join our efforts, if you're um, courageous enough to jump on what you have just seen, um, there's open postings out there. And with that, running a little bit over time, thank you very much, and open for questions afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>